Anyway, look at John chapter 10 and verse number 9. John chapter 10 and verse number 9. Just one quick thought from this chapter. It says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now notice the next words. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Okay, more abundantly. You know, Jesus wants us to enjoy life. Do you know that? You know, He wants you to today have a smile, to be happy, to be thankful for this day that God has given us. And you know, the sermon this afternoon is not going to be anything, anything too deep. It's not going to, I'm not going to be hitting some groundbreaking passages. And, and you know, I just wanted to get to a bit of basic things. We, we did look through uh, first Peter, which is quite meaty. And I just wanted a, a lighter sermon because, again, you know, just, uh, and I know I've talked about some of these things, but we're in COVID-19 world. People are downcast. People are depressed. People are frustrated. I'm a little bit frustrated still, you know, just not knowing exactly, not having a clear picture of what's going to happen in, in three months, in five months, in six months. And it can be very tempting to, you know, uh, be looking at, at news sources, which is giving you, uh, you know, sad information, bad news, constantly giving you bad news. And it's easy to be downcast in the current environment. And so the title for the sermon this afternoon is Six Ways to Enjoy Life. Six Ways to Enjoy Life. Okay? Now you can move away from the book of John. That's why we wanted to look at John. I'm going to get you to turn primarily to Proverbs and Psalms. I'll read to you some other passages, but if you want to find yourself, go, go to Proverbs. Let's start there. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. So like I said, I'll get you to primarily the Psalms and the Proverbs, and I'll be reading to you some other passages. And uh, Proverbs 17, verse 22, please. Proverbs 17, verse 22, says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Okay? What is the best medicine for your life? A merry heart. A happy heart. Okay? Now, I don't know, did you guys ever read the Reader's Digest? I grew up, we used to get this Reader's Digest, you know, mailed to us every month or whatever it was, right? It's a, it's a thing. And I think one of the, they had all these jokes, and one of the, one of the titles was called Laughter is the Best Medicine. That, that's come from, from, uh, from Proverbs there, right? That's where they get it from. Laughter is the best medicine. Yes, having a merry heart, being happy is the best medicine you could possibly have. You know, being downcast, being stressed, being worried and depressed is not just an emotional reaction. Yes, it starts with the emotions, but it has an effect on your body. You know, one reason people have ulcers in their body is just because they're constantly stressed. And the body struggles to, to live a life of depression, okay? Uh, you know, we've been called, or not, yeah, we've been called, you know, God's design for us is to just be happy, just to enjoy life. You know, I think I found the ingredients to just be happy. I mean, I'm just always happy. You know, I, I hear, you know, some bad news. I'm like, well, that's sad, that's bad. But, you know, thank God for whatever, you know. Uh, you know, I can usually turn to something positive and, and have my mind set on that. And so, six ways to enjoy life. Now, please go to Psalm uh, 9. Please go to Psalm 9. Psalm 9. So, the very first thing, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I could have turned this whole sermon into just, you know, serve God, point number one. Number two, just pray to God. Number three, you know, just read your Bible, you know. So, all I want to do with my first point is just summarize all of that into one main point. Psalm 9, verse 2. Psalm 9 verse 2 reads, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. Hey, this is a decision. The psalmist says, look, I don't care. I'm going to be glad. I'm going to rejoice in thee. I'm going to rejoice in God. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. So point number one uh, to, to enjoy life is God must be the center of your life. Okay, God must be be the center of your life. If you try to live a life without God, you're not going to be happy. Right. You know, you, you, can, you can emulate some level of joy, okay? But it's not going to be a true joy. It's not going to be a true merry heart that uh, is good like a medicine, okay? So I, all I want to do with point number one, God must be the center of your life, is just wrap up all those major points that we have about living the Christian life. So now go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 1. Because I do want to give you some more practical things that will give you joy in your life with the, with the other five points, okay? But Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 1, all right? So we want to be able to rejoice in the, rejoice in God. That means you have to have a fellowship with God. He's got to be an important part of your life. You're spending time with God. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, My son, forget not my law, 
but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. You say, I want to have a happy life. Well, you know what's going to contribute to your happy life? The length of days, a long life, peace. Okay, how do I have these things in my life? I don't feel peaceful right now because of COVID-19, because of coronavirus or restrictions or whatever. Can't cross the border because I've got to, you know, uh, iso- uh, what is it? What's the word? Not isolate. Huh? What's that? Quarantine. I've got to quarantine, right? I'm not happy. Well, don't forget God's law. Keep His commandments. Learn what God says. Do what He says. And the promise is you're going to have peace. You're going to have a long life. And you're going to have a happy life. That's, that's the promise from God. You know, just know what He says in His Word and live in accordance to that. You know, in John chapter 15, verse 10, it says, If ye keep my commandments, these are the words of Jesus, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love, These things have I spoken unto you, that your joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. What is Jesus saying? He says, keep my commandments. If you want to be full of joy, if you want the joy to remain in your life, He says, just keep my commandments. And then He says, even, what do you say? Uh, Even as I, just Jesus, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. You know what this tells me? That Jesus was full of joy. You know that every day, you you know, if you went to spend time with Jesus, you went to listen to him preach, you would have said, hey, that's a happy man. Hey, that's a man full of joy. He enjoys being uh, on the earth. He enjoys walking the earth because he's keeping his father's commandments. That's how I can be sure. Do you think Jesus was constantly walking around with a frown? frown? Listen, was he walking on a sin-cursed world? Absolutely. Was he surrounded by false prophets, and false teaching, false doctrine, people full of sin, and Israel that was supposed to love God with all their hearts, mind, and soul, and they're not, they're not doing that? Yeah, but was he just constantly frustrated about that? No, he's keeping his Father's commandments. Tells me he had great joy, okay? Even in the face of being in a bad place. Now, God, out of all places, you know, could find joy even in a sin-cursed world. And so, what is it that's going to give you joy here, brethren? It's keeping the commandments of Jesus, keeping the commandments of God. It's not that my life needs to emulate pastor's life, okay? That's not going to give you joy, okay? Or your favorite pastor, or your favorite preacher. My life has to be like my favorite preacher's life. That's not going to give you joy. I hope your favorite preacher, your favorite pastor, is keeping the commandments of God. I hope they're finding joy in keeping commandments of God, but you're going to find joy keeping commandments with God, okay? The commandments of Jesus Christ. It's not about emulating somebody's life. That's not going to give you the joy you're looking for. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, I love this passage. You don't need to turn there. This passage says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy. And be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Brethren, what else is going to give you great joy? Speaking the words of God. You know, and yes, I think of this as a soul winner going out. I don't know if you think about this, brethren. But those that went soul winning between services, you know what? The mountains, the hills broke forth into joy, into singing. The trees were clapping their hands as you went out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about that. Creation rejoices when you're full of joy, when you're full of peace, taking the good words, the the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, so speaking the things of God, yes, soul winning will give you joy. Maybe not immediately. Oh man, got to get up there, you know, walk the streets, I'm probably going to get rejected. Hey, but I'm telling you, when you're able to give just people, John 3.16, you're just able to open up, hey, you can be sure of going to heaven. You know, your desire is for that person to just hear God's words and because those words give you, have given you great joy. You, wanna, you, wanna, you, wanna, you want them to find that great joy as well. But it's not just soul winning. It's any time you speak God's word. Yes, right now I find great joy preaching God's word, but even during our fellowship, you know, get into the habit of, of speaking about the things of God, you know. Speak about the things you, you heard during the sermon. That's good. Or just other things, how God has blessed you during the week. Hey, talk about God. We're in church amongst fellow believers. You know how hard it is to just find like-minded brethren that you can spend time with? 
all right? I mean, for those of you that have not had a good church, you know you've just been dying. I just want to have, is there another family that believes like we do? Is there another family that I know is saved, right? Who wants to read the King James Bible? I want to be able to talk to them about God. Well, this is the opportunity. Church, all right? Use the opportunity of fellowship. Yes, we can talk about other things, our, our homes, our families, our jobs. That's all important. But let's not forget to talk about the words of God, which gives us great joy. Please, don't be that person that everyone knows when we start talking about God, oh, they're going to change the topic about something carnal, something worldly, because some, they're uncomfortable talking about it. Don't be that person. Don't be that person because we're trying to find joy in the house of God. You know, if, if, you've got to learn to talk about God, even if it makes you uncomfortable. You know, this is, this is something that should be at the tip of our lips because this is going to give you joy. And uh, lastly, John chapter 16, verse 24 says, Hitherto, these are the words of Jesus, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, Ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. What? What's going to give us joy? Praying, asking, saying, God, I have needs. I need prayers answered, Lord. You know, I'm in a difficult position. Lord, help me. That's going to give you joy. And when he answers those prayers, it's going to give you that fullness of joy. Now, look, I could have made any of these points. I could have made that point one, point two, point three. But I just want to make it point number one, right? Point number one is God must be the center of your life. No God, no joy, okay? That's a simple uh, equation for you. You must have God in your life. That's point number one, okay? So now we can build from there, okay? Now uh, I'm, I'm trusting that God is the center of your life. Now you probably want some more practical things that you can do in your life that's going to give you great joy. Well, if you can please, actually, I'll get you to turn here. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Go to Genesis chapter 3. No, actually, no, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Go to Ephesians chapter 6 for me. Point number two, remember it's six ways to enjoy life. Point number one was God must be the center of your life. Point number two is fulfill your role or your purpose. Okay, fulfill your role or your purpose. All right, I'm going to read to you from Genesis 3. You go to Ephesians 6. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. God speaking to Adam, he says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. You know, when God speaks to Adam, it doesn't sound like he's expecting Adam to retire. Because it says, till thou return unto the ground. He says, look, you've got to just keep working, Adam. Okay? You've got to work hard. Okay, that's, what I, that's your role. That's your purpose. You've got to be the provider for your family. Okay? That's, that's what I've created you for, Adam, to be a hard worker, you know, to sweat, to the sweat of thy face. I remember when we started this church and we were meeting at the uh, old hall, or no, in the shed, and how hot, and I was, you know, I'm not used to the humidity of the Sunshine Coast, and my shirt's just wet, sweat. Hey, I'm working by the sweat of my face, praise God. You know, listen, we need to get to that, you know, bring that manliness back and we just work and work hard and be sweaty and be dirty. Hey, we've got to work hard. You know what? That's going to give you joy. It's going to make you tired, yeah, but it's going to give you joy. <laughs> you know, just, just doing what God wants from you. I'm telling you, men, you know, if you're not working a full-time job I'm and you find yourself lacking in joy, you just work a full-time job, you're going to find great joy. You're going to, I'm productive. I've got something to do with my time. I'm accomplishing something. I'm saving up. I'm providing for my family. Listen, that's what God's put into a man to work, okay? I know this world is saying to you, try to retire as early as you can. Invest here, invest there, invest there, and enjoy your life. You're not going to enjoy your life like that. You're not. You know, working hard is what's going to give you joy, doing the function that God has given you. And you might say, well, Pastor Kevin, that's easy for you because you're the pastor. Your job right now is to preach God's Word. Hey, you're in full-time ministry, Pastor. It's easy for you to say that. I'm stuck in some dead-end job. You don't know about my boss. My boss makes my life hell. You know, I hate where I work and stuff like that. You know, Brethren, I don't... You know, if I was not a pastor, I would be just as happy doing any full-time job. In fact, I've found great joy in my previous jobs, okay? I, I, it's not like I had to become a pastor and I'd only be happy in my life if I become a pastor. I think, in fact, people that are like that, I don't think they should be pastors. Amen. Okay? Because how can you tell other people how to have great joy? You know, if the only way you could find joy is being a pastor. How, you know, because not everyone's going to be a pastor, right? I don't think that person's fit for the ministry. But this is why I love Ephesians 6. Okay? Ephesians 6, verse 5. You know, it's, it's, there, are, there are some verses that for me are just so... I've got so many favorite verses, and this is definitely one of my favorite well, passages in the Bible, okay? 
Because yes, I am, I guess, in full-time ministry for the church, and people make the argument, are you in full-time ministry? Well, yeah, I am. I'm serving Jesus full-time, I suppose, if you want to measure it that way. But I truly believe, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, that all of you, all of you are in full-time ministry to Jesus. All of you are. Okay, you don't need to be in the house of God serving as, in, as the occupation to be in full-time ministry. Because look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. And, and for those of you that are working a secular job and you've got a boss of you, please meditate on this passage. It says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. You know what? You know who you work for in your job? Christ. Okay? I don't, who, what, what company do you work for? You know who's over, overseeing that company? Christ is. Okay? If you're full-time in that company, do it as unto Christ. Give it your best. Okay? Be productive. It'll give you joy. Look at verse number six. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. No, no, no. I'm an employee of McDonald's. No. You're a servant. You're an employee of Christ. That's your real job. Okay? If you're saved... Servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Hey, how hard should you work? With all your heart, put your heart into it. Okay? That dead-end job that you've got, guess who's your employer? Jesus Christ has given you that job. And if you set Jesus as your boss, you're going to love it. Hey, I'm serving Jesus full time. Amen. Okay? Some of you, let's keep going. Verse number seven. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Do you get it now? You're in full-time ministry. You're not serving just some men, okay, some, some employer. You're serving Jesus. You're a minister of Jesus. That's your full-time job. Mothers, you raising your children, looking after the house, being a help to your husband. That's your full-time job. You're serving Christ. That's what Christ has left you to do. In fact, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. You know, some of you guys are going to be doing more for Jesus in your full-time capacity than most pastors do behind the pulpit? You know, there's a lot of lazy pastors. Right. There's a lot of lazy pastors that don't do anything. Amen. You know, they don't preach hearty, you know, services, uh, pre sermons. You know, th they don't spend time in the Word of God. They don't spend time in prayer. They don't spend time soul winning. It's like, what do you do with your life? You're meant to be in full-time ministry. What do you do? You know what? And so many of you guys are just there, 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, working hard, you know, you, 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 you know but you set Jesus as your boss. You, you said, no, I'm going to be a servant of Jesus. I'm going to give everything I can. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make Jesus happy in my job. Hey, you're going to be doing more for Jesus Christ than many pastors behind the pulpit. So please, you know, enjoy the job you have. If you can find that joy, look, that's, that's being happy. You're going to find joy just serving Jesus Christ in your full-time ministry, okay? So I don't want anyone to come to tell me that, hey, pastor, you're in full-time ministry. I'll be like, yeah, you're in full-time ministry. If you're not serving Jesus, as, if you haven't put Jesus as your boss, who are you serving then? Okay, we're all in full-time ministry. Children, you're in full-time ministry. Your job right now is to study, do your, do your work, if you're homeschooled or whatever it is, you know, give it all you've got. You know, make Jesus your principal. Make Jesus your teacher. He's trying to give you skills, trying to give you wisdom so you can grow up to be an adult and serve him full time. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. I focus on the men there, but just on to the ladies. 1 Timothy 5, 13. I'm still up to point number two. Fulfill your role or your purpose. And it says here, And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, so that, Actually, these ladies, they're not actually idle, but tattlers also and busy, hey, busy boy, there it is again, busy bodies. We looked at that in the first service. Speaking things which they ought not. Look, this should not be, this is not the role of a woman. This is not God's will for a woman to go house to house, being a busy body about other people's matters, going about gossiping. That's not what you should be doing. Yet that's, so many people do this, okay? I mean, Churches can be full of gossip as well. It's bad. It's horrible. If you want to just destroy a church, just start gossiping about each other. Listen, I know I have some faults in my family. All right? I have some faults. You have some faults. We all have faults. None of us are perfect. Okay? None of us are always righteous. So is that, is that my freedom now to just go gossiping about all the problems you have? telling other people about all your struggles? You going about telling all my struggles that I have, you know, to other people and just tearing the church apart? Listen, that is a wicked thing to do. Wicked, right? Verse number 14. I will, therefore, 
that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. You know what Paul is telling Timothy? There's already people in your church or in the other churches that you've gone to minister where ladies are gossiping and what are they? They're doing the work of Satan. Okay, they've already turned aside after Satan. Satan's got his claws into them. They're going out being a busybody, going house to house, gossiping about this family, about that family, that brother, that, that, that child, that wife, whatever. That is a wicked thing. You can see this is, this is the goal of Satan, for the church to become that way, full of gossip, full of busy, busybodies. Okay? I already know you've got issues, and I know I have issues, and you probably know something, I don't know. Okay? Let's just support each other. Okay, we're all trying to live this life. We're all trying to find joy. You think gossiping, busy body is going to give you joy? You, you know, it's almost like just tearing down others. I mean, that's what the world thinks, right? Just if I tear down others, I'll feel better about myself. No, why don't you lift them up? Okay, in fact, you know, edifying someone else, lifting them up, you know, someone that's depressed and making, giving them joy, giving them comfort, it's going to give you a lot of comfort, knowing that God can use you to edify a brother in Christ. Okay? So point number three, brethren, is, or two, sorry, fulfill your role and your purpose. Okay? Men, work hard. Ladies, guide your house. Be a help to your husband. If you have children, hey, raise your children well. Raise them for the Lord. If you don't have children, hey, do what you can to be the best support you can for your husband. All right? <clears throat> Go to uh, Proverbs chapter 5, please. Proverbs chapter 5 for me. Point number three is find joy in your family. Find joy in your family. Now, I've got 11 kids. You know, I, I've got to find the joy, okay? <laughs> because it can be loud. It's a lot of work. Just coming to church in the morning is a lot of work, okay? You know, um, just, I mean, I don't know how many nappies I've changed. And I'm not even the main guy doing it. It's mainly my wife. But I would say it's in the tens of thousands. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> right? That's not a pleasant job to do, right? And so, you know, taking care of a family is a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. And so we need to find joy. You're spending, look, you spend a lot of hours at work, right, going to work, eight hours at least, whatever. But then you're spending all the other time, I hope anyway, with your family. Hey, let's find joy in our families. You know, uh, I, won't, I won't read uh, Proverbs 5 just yet. Ephesians 6 verse 2 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment we've promised. Why should we honor our parents? Verse number three, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Hey, we want to have joy. You want to live long? You want it to be well with you? Start with honoring your parents. Okay? Be thankful for mom and dad. Okay? Be thankful that they've given you life. I don't care if they're saved or unsaved. I do care if they're unsaved. But that's not important. Whether they're saved or unsaved, you still honor your parents. Okay? You know what? Your unsaved parents... They st your mom still, uh, you know, carried you for nine months. She still went with the pain. She still labored in the hospital. She still gave birth and there are risks to giving birth. She still went through all of that just to give you life, even if she's unsaved. Okay? There's still a reason, there's still a way you can honor your parents, even if they reject Jesus Christ. Okay? Honor your parents. Your, your dad, you know, my dad was never in my life. Well, you know, without him, you wouldn't have life. It wouldn't be you if it wasn't for your dad. Even if it's some guy you've never met, you've never seen his face, you don't even know who he is potentially. I don't know. You know, we all, you know, people come from different challenging backgrounds, right? But listen, your call is to honor your parents. Okay? You give honor to your parents, and God promises you it'll be well with you and you'll have a long life. Now, brethren, I don't think this is a, I don't think this is a hard thing to do, really. I, I don't, I mean, you say, because your, your parents are Christians and you grew up in a good house. Yeah, I did. I'm very thankful for that, okay? But just thinking about just what my mother went through to give birth to me. It, you know, my mother was suffering with some, some type of diabetes. I think she was in hospital most of her nine months to give birth to me, all right? In fact, I think she went into hospital. I don't think my mom will mind me saying this, but to, to remove her uh, uterus because she was having some major complications, and so they were going to do some operation to remove a uterus, and they said, well, we can't do that just yet because you've got a baby. <laughs> okay, that was me. <laughs> All right. But then she was stuck in hospital, you know, pretty much the whole time. And I can't remember exactly what my mom suffered with, but just thinking about what my mother went through to give me life, that's enough to say I've got to honor her. You know, I need to appreciate what they've done for me. And, you know, brethren, this is going to give you joy, just having joy in your 
family, being thankful for what they've done to give you life. Look at Proverbs 5.18. Proverbs 5.18. It reads, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Hey, find joy. Men, husbands, find joy with your wives. Okay? Hey, when you were dating her, when you wanted to win her over, woo her, yeah, you know, you probably had a lot of joy then, right? You're trying to win her over, but now that you've been married for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we kind of drifted apart. You know, we don't find the same joy. That's not good. That's not good. Okay? Please find joy in your wife. You know, one reason I'm excited to get down to Sydney, it's not the main reason, it's just so somebody can babysit our kids and I can take my wife somewhere. <laughs> just spend time with her, just to have joy with my wife. Okay, I have joy with my kids. We'll, go, we'll look at that soon. You should have joy with your kids as well, okay? But, you know, you're mar- you've married that person. That's for life. You've made a commitment. Till the day I die, you're going to be my wife or my husband, whatever it is, right? You've made that commitment. So find joy in that. How bad would it be if you're just frustrated, angry at the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with? Right? Find joy with your wife. If you can go to Proverbs 15... I'm going to read to you from Song of Solomon 5.16. The wife says that her husband, his mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. I love that verse. I love that verse, right? Because this wife, she's got friends, she's got daughters of Jerusalem, other ladies that she talks to, okay? But her friend, okay, her beloved is her husband. She says to her friends, her girlfriends, she says, look, my best friend is my husband. My beloved is my husband. That's the guy I want to spend time with. That's the person I want to spend time with. See, the, the, the wife in the book of Song of Solomon is able to find joy in her husband. Okay? Yes, she spends time with some of her friends, but her main joy is spending time with her husband. Find joy in your family. Proverbs 15 verse 20. Proverbs 15 verse 20. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother, okay? The first part of that is the wise son maketh a glad father. Parents, you want to be happy? You want to be glad? Well, you've got to make your children wise, okay? Don't just let them grow up without knowledge and wisdom and education. Teach them, guide them, instruct them, okay? So they can grow up and be wise. You know, this is a bad analogy, all right? But my kids have been playing soccer the last few weeks, Last season, they lost all their games. Did you lose all your games last season? I think so. Or well, most of them, most of them. This season, the last three weeks or four weeks, they've won every game. All right? And I'm, just wa- and I'm watching them play. And okay, this is a dumb analogy, I know, because sports, are, you know, it's vanity. It's not the most important thing in this world. But hey, uh, what I see is growth. What I see is uh, playing smart, playing with wisdom. And guess what? I'm watching them I'm like, oh, wow, look how good they're doing. It's giving me a bit of joy. Okay, it's giving me a bit of joy. But you know what? Not just that, but when I see my children grow up one day, grow up, they grow up and be married, my sons get, to get a full-time job, that's going to give me gladness as well to know, hey, my children are doing well. Okay, they've learned, they've grown, they're applying themselves in this world, they're going to be able to look after themselves. Okay, so we can find joy in our children, but only if they get wisdom, only if they mature and gain knowledge. You know, if we treat our children and let them just be a bogan, you're not going to find joy in that, right? Just, just a, a low-life bogan. You're not going to have joy in your children. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, go, to, go to Psalm 113. Was there a better word to use than bogan? No, 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 no. All right, <laughs> all right, <laughs> okay. Bozo, all right. <laughs> uh, Psalm 113, verse 9. Psalm 113, verse 9. Psalm 113, verse 9. These are all passages I've covered in the past, but it's important to be reminded. It said, He maketh the barren woman to keep house. What a promise, okay? Barren woman. You know, being barren is an issue, was a complication that even women in the Old Testament had. You know, when I married my wife, she was told she'd be able to have no kids. (laughs) We went the first nine months, you know, Christina would not fall pregnant, right? But what's the promise? It says here that He'll make the barren woman to keep house, and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. A joyful mother of children. Mothers, can you say about yourself that you're a joyful mother? I want that for you. I want you to find joy 
in your family. Okay, so let's raise our children to love the Lord, to serve the Lord. They're going to make mistakes. Yes, they're going to sin. Yes, but hey, we use those opportunities to instruct them, to guide them, so they can learn from the mistakes that they've made. Look at Psalm 127. Psalm 127 verse 5. Psalm 127 verse 5. Psalm 127 verse 5. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Happy is, maybe that's why I'm happy. A quiver, am I quiver full? I don't know. Should I keep going, Christina? It's up to you. <laughs> let's keep going. If the Lord blesses us, let's keep going. Looks like the more you have, it says like you're happy. The more children you have, the happier you will be. Okay? And you say, well, you know, it's too late for us. We, we've only had this many children. And Look, just find joy in the children that God has given you. Okay? Find joy in the children you have, you know, God has given you. And you know what? Even if you don't have children, you know, you know how you can have children? You preach some on the gospel. You get them saved. They're born again. Hey, you're like a spiritual parent to that person. You've given spiritual birth to that new soul. And you can find joy in that, in spiritual children, just as much. Okay? Proverbs 23 verse 24 says, The father of the righteous shall, re shall greatly rejoice. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Okay? So let's understand this. Okay? Having a quiver full of children will give you joy, yes. Okay? But as I said, parents, you need to give them wisdom. Right? You need to help them become righteous. Do what's right. Do what God wants from them. Because it said the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. Greatly rejoice. Okay? You know what that means? That means if your children are not righteous, okay, you don't teach them between right and wrong. They destroy their lives. You know, they become bums. They become bozos, right, with their lives. It's not, you're not going to be able to greatly rejoice. Okay? You know, me having 11 kids, that's wonderful. But what if I just let them all go to, you know, go to the world? You know, live after Satan. You know, not care about the things of God. Do you think I'm going to be rejoicing? First thing I'll be doing is stepping down as pastor if all my kids go to the world like that, right? I'm not going to have joy in that, all right? So it's not about how many kids you have. It's raising them to love the Lord, raising them to know the difference between right and wrong. So point number three is find joy in your family. Now, if you can... Uh, well, what can I get you to turn? Go to, if you can keep, yeah, go to 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Point number four, and, uh, well, point number four is this, and, and some people, I don't know, I think some Christians, or some pastors may not necessarily want to preach point number four, but I see it through the Bible, okay? Point number four is enjoy the fruit of your hands, okay, or the fruit of your labor, okay, the fruit of your hands. You know, I, I told you that, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we need to do is find joy in the role that God has given us. Live out that role, you're going to find joy and you know what? When you're doing what God wants from you, you're going to be able to, uh, you know, reap the harvest. You're going to be able to earn. Like, you've got to work. You earn a paycheck. You know, you're going to be able to buy the things that you need. You might even buy some of the things that just give you uh, some, 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 some joy in your life, right? There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruit of your hands. I'm going to read to you from Ecclesiastes 2.24, which says, There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. Okay? So whatever possessions you have, whatever wealth you, you amass in this life, you know, don't live for, for the riches. You know, but God gives you what you need. God has given you probably more than you need. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruit of your hands. You know, the labor of your hands. You know, I've got a brother down in Sydney. He's got a really fancy car. Like it's, 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 you know, I don't even know what it is right now. It's some really fancy car. And, you know, we, hope we have church in Fairfield, which is, yeah, it's not the greatest area. Right? And then you have this nice car rocking, you know, it's like, wow, well, look at that, right? And he said to me, I just feel really bad. Because obviously he bought it before, I think he bought it before he was saved, you know, he was worldly, all that stuff. And he goes, I don't know, should I sell this car? You know, it's making him feel, look, it's the labor of your hands. You've worked hard, you've got it. Just be thankful to God now that you have it. Just enjoy it. As long as you're not setting your heart on that, okay? As long as that's not what, that what gives you purpose in life. Now, I'm not going to go out of my way and buy a car like that. I don't think I'm going to find joy in nice cars anyway, 
you know, I'm quite happy with my Toyota Corolla. Gives me, that gives me joy. All right? But you know what? Just whatever you have, whatever the fruit of your hands is, just say, God has given this to me, what I've eaten, what I've drunk, you know, the good of my labor, God's given it to you. Enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. It says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Okay? So don't trust in the riches, but in the living God. So that's who you trust in. In the living God, look at this, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Okay? This is preaching to a rich person. A person that might have a big house and nice cars and have the possessions, have a nice swimming pool. I'm not living for that. But, you know, some people might fall into that situation for whatever reasons, right? Maybe some inheritance, whatever. Or maybe they just lived for that before in the past and now they've put that. Well, you know what? You've got it. Just trust in God. He's given it to you. Hey, and, and, and realize that God has given it to you richly all things to enjoy. Just enjoy it. You know, God wants you to be happy in life. Say, why don't priest, pastors want to preach this? Because it sounds charismatic almost. <laughs> it almost sounds like a Pentecostal teaching, something a Baptist don't teach. Right? No, but you know what? If God's given it to you, just be thankful. Don't trust in those uncertain riches. Trust in God. Be thankful God's given it to you. Use it. You know, you've got a pool. Hey, you know, invite the kids over for a swim, whatever it is, right? I mean, just enjoy what God has given us. If you look at verse number 6, same chapter, 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 6, verse 6, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain okay godliness with contentment what's contentment happy being being happy being satisfied with what god has given us enjoy the things god has given you we live in a good country we live in australia you know i i i i'm, I'm i don't feel guilty going to the lake and going for a swim i don't feel guilty about enjoying this nice land that god has given us you know i, I don't you know there, there are other believers that live in hell holes, I understand, places that aren't as pretty as the Sunshine Coast. But you know what? God's put me here. He's given me this lovely place. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to find joy in life. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Please go to Psalm 118, please. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Point number five. Point number five is... Live every day to its fullest. Live every day. Every day. Yes, today. Live it to your fullest, okay? You come to church, we sing songs. Hey, sing to your fullest. You're listening to preachers, give your fullest attention you can to the preaching of God's Word, right? It's, and have time of fellowship. Hey, use it to the fullest. Enjoy the time one another. You've gone soul winning. Hey, just labor hard. Give the best you can as you go door to door soul winning and, and just, just enjoy every day that God has given us. Look at Psalm 118, verse 24. Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, you say that's just Sundays. No, it's Monday. That's Tuesday. That's Wednesday. That's Thursday. That's Friday. That's Saturday. That's every day that you have, every day that you wake up, that you've got life, you haven't passed away in your sleep, say, this is the day that God has made. I'm going to be glad. I'm going to rejoice in this day. Be thankful for every day that you wake up because so many people did not wake up to this day that we have today. You know, many have died, you know, gone to hell. A lot of people go into hell every single day. You get to wake up in this life. Hey, enjoy it. Find joy in the day that God, look, it's a day which the Lord hath made. You know what? What's going to happen on Halloween? You know, on that day, that evil day where people celebrate things. You know what? I'm going to wake up on Halloween and I'm going to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to be glad and rejoice in it. Amen. Whatever day the, the world or Satan wants to take for himself, I don't care. God made that day and I'm going to be thankful to him. I'm going to rejoice in that day. Okay? And don't forget Halloween. When's Halloween coming up? October? I'm going to miss it, aren't I? Oh, don't forget, that's our soul winning day. Okay? Because people are expecting door-to-door -door visitors. Okay, we did it last year. We had great success. You know, even if I'm not here, let's make sure we do it, okay? Brother Michael, that's your job, Halloween, okay? It's, it's a day that the Lord has made, you know? People are going to get saved on that day, you know? <clears throat> Can you go to Psalm 90? Go to Psalm 90. You know, we should be looking at every day as a day that we can accomplish something, okay? Don't let it be a day of waste where I just turn on the TV 
I get a bowl of chips or a bowl of ice cream, whatever your choice is, and I'm just gonna, I'm just, that's all I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna watch some TV show, I'm gonna watch some movie, I'm gonna catch up on some, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm, look, that's just, you're just wasting the day. You think that's why God gave you that day? Did God give you that day just so you can get on and just play some video games all day, watch TV all day, and just be a bum all day? Is that why God gave you the day? No, okay? Why did God give you Sunday? To be in church, okay? To be thankful, to rejoice in the Lord, to sing in praises. Think of every day, what can I accomplish today? What is it that I can accomplish, okay? Psalm 90 verse 12. Psalm 90 verse 12. It says, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Okay? Not to apply our hearts to television and video games and just wasting your life away, right? Teach us. So this is something we don't fully get in our minds. You know, we think we're going to be here tomorrow. We think we're going to be here next week, a month from now. We think we're going to be on this earth 10 years from now, okay? No, we need to be taught to number our days. You know what? Tomorrow, you're going to have less days than you had today on this earth. You know, um, I'm, what am I now, 39? That's less days. I've got less days to live on this earth than I lived when I had when I was 10 years old, all right? Every day that goes by is a day that will not be returned to you. It's not coming back. It's gone, okay? Time. Time keeps going. You know, that there, was, there was a time in my life when I was sort of working hard. You know, for, when I first started to work, got married, money was really important to me in the sense, not, not that I set my heart on those things. It's important because you need to pay rent. You need to pay the bills, right? You've got to put food on the table, you know? And, and so it was really important for me to make sure that I could save up as much as I can for a rainy day. But as I've gotten older... And as my responsibilities have increased and my time, you know, w with different family members or different people has, takes up more of my time, time has become more valuable to me than money, okay? Honestly, like, I, I, I'd almost just rather spend some, some crazy amount of money if it saves me a lot of time. Because time, I'm not going to get time back. Money comes and goes, but time doesn't return, okay? S yesterday, Saturday, is not going to come back. It's gone, Okay, and if you wasted Saturday, that's a waste. You, you've wasted a day. You need to learn to number the days and understand every day that I get is not guaranteed. God has given me this day. I need to do something productive with it that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Can you do that? At least let's start there and say, look, when you wake up tomorrow morning, you say, I'm going to apply my heart to wisdom. There's something I need to learn today. There's something I need to do today. Something I'm going to be productive in today. Just make that a decision every day. Don't let a day go by that is wasted. Point number six, if you can go to, uh, go to Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four. And I know I've already preached on this, but I need to preach it again. And I think I'm going to have to keep preaching this until the COVID-19 thing goes away. And if it doesn't go away, I'm just going to keep preaching it. Okay. <laughs> Philippians chapter four, please. Philippians chapter four. So let me just go for those points again. Point number one was God must be the center of your life. Point number two is fulfill your role or purpose. Point number three is find joy in your family. Point number four is enjoy the fruit of your hands. Point number five is live every day to its fullest. And point number six is think on the positive. Okay? Think on positive things. There's too much negativity. Too much, brethren. Okay? When I talk to you, when I fellowship with you, do you think I want to have a negative experience or a positive experience when I talk to you? Okay. I mean, what about me? You come to me, do you want to you know, have a positive interaction or a negative one? You know, after you talk to me, do you want to feel encouraged, motivated, or do you want to feel a bit downcast and upset and sad and worried? Which of those two things, right? And basically, you, you can kind of tell by the person you talk to whether that person dwells on positive things or if he dwells on negative things, right? Now, look, there's nothing wrong because the world is negative, okay? That there is a lot of problems, a lot of trials. There's nothing wrong with discussing these things, but don't let this become all you're engrossed about, you know? Just how wicked this world is. You know, I, I remember, and I've, I've said this, I've used this before. I remember as a child, I thought everyone wanted to be good. Whether you're saved or unsaved, I thought even the unsaved wanted to be good people, Right? Because again, you ask people, well, what do you have to do to go to heaven? I've got to be a good person. So I think, okay, maybe you're trying to be a good person. I can't remember when, how old I was, 12, 13, where it dawned on me. Actually, everyone's wicked. 
<laughs> it's like, you know, it, my, heart, my heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it, right? I mean, all of a sudden I realize instead of people just naturally wanting to be good, actually, because of our sin nature, everyone naturally is trying to be bad. And being good is the effort. It's harder to be good <laughs> than to be evil, to be wicked, right? And it dawned on me. I remember when, when Nicholas watched uh, Psychopath Reprobates, the DVD. I mean, he was left in trauma. For, for how long? Was it a month? <laughs> I mean, he, he couldn't believe how wicked people can become, right? Because it's not, you know, as a child, you think everyone's just trying to be, live good, trying to be righteous, you know, trying to work their way to heaven, be a good person. So, and then it dawns on you, wow, this is a wicked world. And then you start wanting to know maybe how wicked the world is. You know, you become inquisitive, you get down some rabbit holes, and boy, you know, I can't even, uh, my brain don't, doesn't even process how wicked this world is, Okay. And then you can get downcast. And then COVID-19 happens. And because you've invested so much time trying to learn about the wickedness of this world, there's a conspiracy at every corner. You're, you're just constantly a victim, okay? And, and it's just negativity. It's just going to be negativity. And that's all that's going to come out of you. You know, fear, worries, concerns, stress, because that's what you spend all your time on, okay? And so in Philippians 4.8, it says... Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Okay, what's true? That's something honorable, genuine, right? The, the, you know, um, yeah, genuine or true. Whatsoever things are honest, okay? Whatsoever things are just. What's just? Things that are right or lawful. Whatsoever things are pure. Pure is something that is free from contamination. Whatsoever things are lovely. What's lovely? Things that are beautiful, delightful, pleasing. Whatsoever things are of good report. Hey, that's good news. That's not turning on Channel 7 News or Channel 9 News. That's not good news, brethren. It's bad news. Good news does not rate. Okay, you don't get viewers when you're giving people good news. You only get, we got daughters all giving good news all the time. Do you have thousands of people following you? But I tell you, you start a YouTube channel with bad news, you're going to have tens of thousands of people logging in and subscribing to your YouTube channel. If there be any virtue, what's virtue? Moral excellence. If there be any praise, what's praise? Being grateful, being thankworthy about something. Think on these things. I can't stress this enough. You want to find joy? You want to be happy today in a COVID-19 world? Think on these things, okay? Things that are true, honest, good report, pure, lovely, just, things of virtue, things of praise. Think on these things. Please. The TV is going to drive you nuts, okay? Listen, 10 years from now, Labor will still complain that the Liberal Party is all about big business. And the Liberal Party is still going to be complaining that Labor overspent, Okay, 10 years from now, I promise you, you're not going to miss anything. Switch that stuff off, all right? 10 years from now, what else is going to happen on the news? There's going to be some natural disaster. I promise you, in 10 years, is there going to be a natural, you're going to turn it on, there's going to be some earthquake, Christchurch broke down again, you know, fell apart again, okay? <laughs> there's going to be some, what else is going to be on the news in 10 years' time, huh? You think there'll be another pandemic in 10 years' time? Maybe. Maybe 100 years from now there'll be a new pandemic. There'll be something to be stressed about, okay? Something. What else is on the news in 10 years? Rugby. Rugby. Yeah. You know? Soccer. Soccer. Yeah, amen. <laughs> <laughs> AFL. It's, it's, yeah, someone won. Someone won and someone lost, brethren. Okay? In, in, in the game. And what, what else? Oh, the, uh, the RBA, the Royal Bank of Australia. They, they maybe lifted interest rates or they decreased interest rates. Okay, in 10 years it's going to happen again. All right, you're not going to miss anything by turning off the bad news that just gets you depressed and cast down. Okay, get rid of it. Now you say to me, you know what, I, I can still watch that every day. I don't have to watch this stuff every day. Anyway, I can still watch this every day and I still am happy. I'm still a happy person. Good on you. You know what's going to make you even happier? Turn it off. Get rid of it. In fact, if you turn it off for a whole month, I promise you, even if you say you're a happy person, you're going to be even happier. You're going to be even happier turning that stuff off. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, that's why I don't watch the mainstream media. I go to the alternative media on YouTube. Yeah, you know, it's even more depressing. Because instead of being focused on wickedness of this world, when I go to the truth movement, it's just, well, it's wicked because everyone's satanic. You know, everyone's just drinking people's blood. 
and there are babies being sacrificed. It's like, man, this is even worse. <laughs> what are we to be thinking on? Good news, things of good report. If brother so-and-so gets a promotion, that's good news. I'm going to think about that. Praise God he got a promotion. Okay? Hey, you got a soul saved. Praise God. Yes, that soul got saved for all eternity. Things that are lovely, beautiful, delight. Yes, get out there and then look at the, look at the ocean. Yeah, you know? Brother Jason sometimes takes nice photos on Facebook. I'm glad it's not some crazy meme all the time. But, it's, you know, there's some nice scenery there. Well, that's lovely. That's beautiful. I'm going to think on that. Yeah, I want to go where here when I want to get some of that fresh sea breeze, some of that fresh air into my, into my lungs. All right? Things that are, look, things that are, remember what it said, things that are true, what sort of things are honest? These are basically the same thing. It's saying the same thing twice. True and honest. I, I've said this before. A lot of those conspiracy theories, there is truth. There is a lot of truth. But it's, is it completely true? No. There's a lot of opinions of man. Okay? There's a lot of false ideas. All right? This thing with Syria, this bomb, it's sad. Okay? But I'm going to think of positive. I'm going to say, God, can you raise some people to go soul winning in that area? Can you raise someone to go and give people the gospel? They need to hear it now, Lord. They're hurting people. They're hurting right now. That's what I'm going to be focused on. You know, the positive side of it. What can we get out of this? Instead of thinking, oh, this is the, you know, that's it. The Antichrist is going to come tomorrow. Okay? And we're going to lose our lives. Get beheaded now. Get ready, brethren. You know why I don't preach about that stuff all the time? Like, why I don't, you know... And I, there's a lot of preachers to just focus on the end times. I was doing the end times series before the COVID-19 restrictions. And I just found myself with the COVID ideas and just speaking about, you know, tribulation. I decided to feel a bit downcast about it. I need to preach something positive, you know, change it up a little bit. Because, you know, throughout history, every Christian that's gone through some difficulty, some, you know, Spanish flu, some world war, they've always said, this is the end. The Antichrist is around the corner. And every time they've got egg on their face. You know, I'm not going to tell you until I see the abomination of desolation, until I see the Antichrist exalt himself, come back from the dead, whatever that looks like, claim to be Jesus, then I'll be saying to you, brethren, this is it. Until then, I, it's just another strange day in this world. Thank God this is not my world. Thank God this is not my home. Okay? Think on the positives. And uh, you're in Philippians. I'll, I'll read some other passages to you. First Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says... For he that will love life and see good days, oh, see good days, we covered this last week. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. You want to have good days, brethren? Like I said, don't go around gossiping. Don't be tearing other people down. Use your mouth, use your tongue for good, for edification, okay? Think of positive things. Yes, sister so-and-so let you down, but you know what? She's also got really good uh, attributes about it as well. You know what? She's your sister in the Lord. She's been saved by Jesus Christ. You know what? She's learning the Bible. She's trying to live for God. Can you think about the positives rather than all the little issues that she has in her life? Or brother so-and-so? Right? Proverbs 15 verse 23 says, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. How good is it? You know what? If you have a positive message, if you have something that can help someone in some difficulty, some trial, you can encourage someone, it says here, you will have joy by the answer of your mouth. Your own answer can give you joy because you've been able to help somebody else because you're thinking, how can I be a positive influence to others? And so, brethren, the title of the sermon was Six Ways to Enjoy Life. Number one, God must be the center of your life. Number two, fulfill your role, your purpose. Number three, find joy in your family. Four, enjoy the fruit of your hands. Five, live every day to its fullest. And number six, think on the positives. Let's pray.